Aloha mai kako, and good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to a special edition of China Seminar presented by the East-West Center, Friends of the East-West Center, and U.S. Embassy Beijing. My name is Susie Varislam, proud president of the East-West Center. The East-West Center was established by the U.S. Congress to promote better relations among people and nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through cooperative study, research, and dialogue. And before I introduce our esteemed speaker, a few housekeeping notes. Today's talk is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for your friends and family that couldn't make it online today. And the public was invited to submit questions for Ambassador Burns. And as you can imagine, we received a considerable amount on a wide range of topics. And we will do our best to cover as many questions as possible during the moderated discussion. So what you've been waiting for, we are honored and privileged to have here today the U.S. Ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, to discuss the state of the U.S.-China bilateral relations 45 years after the establishment of full diplomatic relations between the two countries. Ambassador Burns started his role in December 2021, where he had to quarantine actually in Shanghai for over 60 days, I understand, Ambassador. And as the ambassador, he leads an amazing team of public servants from 48 U.S. government agencies, sub-agencies at the U.S. mission in China. And he oversees the mission's interaction with the PRC on a full range of political, security, economic, commercial, counselor, and other issues to, that shape this critical relationship. You know, he first visited China in 1998, accompanying Secretary of State George Shultz and then President George H.W. Bush in 1989. He subsequently made visits to China with Secretaries Warren Christopher, Madeleine Albright as spokesperson, including during the handover of Hong Kong from the United Kingdom to the PRC in 1997. As the Under Secretary of State, he worked with the PRC government on a diverse range of issues, including Afghanistan, North Korea, United Nations sanctions against Iran, and U.S. policy in the Indo-Pacific. And as a private citizen, he also created and managed an Aspen Strategy Group policy dialogue with the PRC government's Central Party School. Ambassador Burns has had a long career in American diplomacy, serving six presidents and nine secretaries of state, receiving, not surprisingly, numerous awards, including the Presidential Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. I could go on and on, but I know we're all eager to hear Ambassador Burns' insight. So without further ado, please help me welcome, warm, warm welcome to Ambassador Burns. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Susie, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you. And, um, you know, this is um, something I've wanted to do since I was in Honolulu visiting our Indo-Pacific Command in January. You'll remember I was supposed to come over to your center, the East-West Center, and speak to you, but I had to go um, to Bangkok uh, suddenly for a meeting. And so I apologize for having missed that, but I'm really glad to be with you today. And I guess I should say um, good evening or good afternoon to everybody in the United States. Uh, it's Friday morning, March 15th, here in North China, in Beijing. And I'm looking forward to a good conversation uh, Susie and I agreed that I might say a few words just at the top to get the conversation going. Um, and I'd like to make three points, if I could, about the state of U.S.-China relations as they currently exist. First point is that I think 2023, especially the second half of 2023, um, led to um, a relatively more stable relationship between our government uh, in the United States and the government of the People's Republic of China. You'll all remember that we had a series of, um, of disagreements in 2022, uh, particularly concerning the visit of uh, Speaker of the House, then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. We supported the Speaker's right to visit. That led to a downturn in the relationship uh, caused by the government in China. Then there was the balloon incident in February of 2023, led to another downturn in the relationship. And um, I think both sides agreed by last spring and early summer that we really needed better connectivity. We needed cabinet channels of communication because we have very serious differences and we're competitors on many, many issues. And so you'll remember that our Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, our Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, our Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, all visited Beijing. And we had not had cabinet visits to China in four years from any of those cabinet departments 
Uh, our then climate negotiator, John Kerry, was here. And we had the first visit by members of Congress in four and a half years when the Democratic uh, majority leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, led a bipartisan delegation to China in October of last autumn. That all set the stage for a very important meeting between President Joe Biden and uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in California, Woodside, California, just north of the Stanford campus in November. And that meeting um, was constructive. We thought it was very productive. It didn't resolve all many of the outstanding differences on major issues. But what it did was it confirmed the judgment of both countries that as we are competitors, it's very important that we have constant communications. And there were four specific agreements from that California meeting that I think are worth noting. Number one, the Chinese agreed to help the United States on the fentanyl problem. I think any American on this um, uh, on this broadcast, we'll understand it's is a scourge in our society, fentanyl. It's the leading cause of death of Americans 18 to 49. Uh, President Xi, Xi Jinping, agreed that China would help the United States. The problem was that uh, a great percentage of the precursor chemicals um, that were being shipped to the drug cartels in Mexico and Central America came from black market Chinese firms. And I must say, since uh, Cal the California meeting, we um, we're grateful for the assistance of the government of China. Our, our drug enforcement agency has worked very, very hard, our Department of Homeland Security, to try to work with the Chinese, and it's expanded our law enforcement cooperation on the fentanyl issue. The second agreement uh, in California was that we had to have much better communication between our militaries, particularly our civilian and um, and uniform officers, between the um, United States Department of Defense and the People's Liberation Army. Uh, those ties have been frozen by the Chinese, not by the United States, following Speaker Pelosi's visit 18 months ago. And, you know, the problem there is that our militaries, our navies, um, and um, our air forces are often operating in very close proximity to each other in the Spratleys, the international waters of the Spratly and Paracel Islands in the South China Sea, uh, of the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, and of course in the Taiwan Strait. And uh, we want to avoid conflict, obviously, both sides and both leaders have stated that. And so you do want a situation where if there were a misunderstanding or an accident, the two military leaderships could be in quick contact with each other. And so um, our new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Brown, has had an initial conversation back in late December with his Chinese counterpart. I very much hope that Secretary Austin, our Secretary of Defense, will be able to speak as well uh, to his counterpart. And then we hope to have a series of um, of meetings between some of our tactical commanders as well. So that was a very important result of the California meeting. Third, we agreed with the Chinese that we had to have uh, a discussion of the risks associated with artificial intelligence. And that discussion has not yet commenced, but we're actively discussing how to do it with the Chinese right now. And fourth, um, we also agreed at California that we had to reconnect the peoples of the United States and the peoples uh, of uh, Republic of China. COVID pulled us apart. Uh, and so we have far fewer tourists and business people and students traveling in each other's countries. As the student situation was particularly problematic, while we still have uh, 292,000 Chinese students in the United States, uh, most of the stu American students went home during co zero COVID, the Chinese uh, policy of zero COVID with all the restrictions and the quarantines and the lockdowns. We went from 15,000 American students in China eight or nine years ago to 350, 350 last year, 2023. We're up, we've more than doubled, but from a very low base, we're up to about 800 American students now. And that's true of tourists, tourism's down as well. You do want people to be connected in a relationship between the two largest economies in the world. People ask are really the foundation of any kind of uh, diplomatic relationship. And so we're working hard on both sides to try to increase the number of flights between the two countries. We'll be up to 100 direct flights a week between China and the United States uh, at the end of this month. But compare that to pre-COVID totals, 345 direct flights a week. So you can see the problem of just getting people to travel uh, back and forth. So we saw the California meeting leading to 
a stabilization of sorts uh, in the relationship between the two countries. And that, that's the first point, uh, Susie, that I wanted to make. Second point is this relationship remains highly competitive. And I think that I certainly view the relationship between the two countries as the fact that we're systemic rivals. We will very likely be systemic rivals well into the next decade. It's very important that we manage the differences between us responsibly. And as Pre President Biden said in his State of the Union address last week, obviously to avoid conflict between the two countries. But the competition is quite profound. Uh, we're certainly rivals in the security and military sphere out here in the Indo-Pacific. The United States, of course, has been a Pacific power uh, in terms of the positioning of our military forces, really, since the end of the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century, but particularly after the Second World War, we became in many ways a guarantor of peace in the Indo-Pacific region and a guarantor of commercial traffic and maritime traffic in the busiest uh, part of the world for commercial shipping. And that's the, of course, the South and East China Seas, uh, the Western Pacific, and also the Taiwan Strait. And um, there's a competition underway for military power and military influence. And of course, we're determined uh, to maintain our alliance commitments out here with Japan, with the Republic of Korea, with the Philippines, with Thailand, with Australia, our defense agreements with New Zealand, the new AUKUS arrangement, and of course, the Quad arrangement, where uh, Japan, Australia, the United States are working very closely in, in many respects with India. So that's a very profound uh, competitive uh, basis of the relationship. Technology is part of this competition. In fact, I see technology in many ways as the ha heart of the battle because it will be technology developments, whether it's in artificial intelligence, in machine learning, in quantum uh, sciences, uh, in biotechnology, that will not only change the global economy and our life in terms of the commercial technologies, but many of these technologies will lead to new military technologies that will define the balance of power in the future. So you've seen the United States act with a great sense of purpose to deny sales to China of advanced American technology, uh, advanced semiconductors for use in artificial intelligence, for instance. We want to deny the sales of those technologies so that they cannot be used by the People's Liberation Army to outpoint the United States. The president also issued President Biden an executive order that governs and limits the ability of some American of American companies to invest in artificial intelligence enterprises here in China. And um, we call this a policy of de-risking, uh, that um, we need to learn the lessons of the pandemic, and that is, in some respects, alter our supply chains for critical materials and critical minerals so that they're closer to home or in trusted hands with an allied uh, country of the United States. So that's a very important part of what we're doing now in technology. And I should add, however, there have been a lot of complaints by the government here in China of our de-risking policy, complaints that we're denying some of these advanced technologies, but I've explained the purpose. It's important to point out that uh, the government of the People's Republic of China has the same policy. They deny the ability of their countries to export what they call their core technologies for national security to the United States. In fact, I would make the case that China began de-risking, limiting some of these sales well before the United States did. We also have in this competitive realm, uh, of course, a, a major trade relationship. China is the third largest trade partner of the United States, $575 billion in two-way trade last year alone. China is the largest market for American agriculture sales, one fifth of all of our ag exports from the United States, from our fisheries, from our ranchers, our farms go to China. So that's a major relationship. And yet we believe, we know that the um, trade relationship um, does not provide many American firms with a level playing field. Intellectual property theft, forced technology transfers are still a major problem here. So we work very hard on that. Uh, my embassy here, our embassy, uh, work with American businesses to try to give them a fair chance in the marketplace uh, in the second largest economy in the world here in China. And fourth, and it's certainly not fourth in priority, for me it's number one, we have profound differences uh, with the Communist Party of China, with the People's Republic government about 
uh, human freedom and human rights. And we've been particularly critical of the actions of the government in Xinjiang against the Uyghur population in Tibet, and also in Hong Kong, where I spent a couple of days uh, earlier this week. So a highly competitive part of this relationship, I think in many ways, it's the weightiest part of this relationship. But I want to stress again, uh, we've been very clear that as we compete with China, we will do so um, without conflict and, and obviously peacefully. Final point, Susie, and then we can get to a, a, a conversation. Uh, I don't want to speak too long. Final point is we, we're we heavily on the competitive side in this relationship, but there are issues where we believe, and I think the government here in Beijing believes we can work together, where the two strongest countries in the world, particularly technologically and in terms of our economic power, uh, can work together. Climate change is a good example of that. We're the two leading carbon emitters. Uh, it was really President Obama and President Xi Jinping who put together in 2015 the Paris Agreement that has led to this new era of trying to limit the average increase in the global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're not there right now, uh, but we're working hard. China is the leading emitter in the world. About 30% of global emissions come from China. The United States, uh, about 11%. Our emissions are declining because of change, uh, the change in our energy makeup particularly over the last 10 to 20 years. But nonetheless, we have to work together. Uh, John Kerry has just stepped down uh, last week as the American climate negotiator. And I must say, I've got to give him enormous credit. He's indefatigable on this issue. He traveled the world for three years. He's someone I know quite well. We're both from Boston. I work closely with him uh, from my perch here in Beijing. Uh, he's, he has been succeeded over the last week by another great American climate negotiator, someone else I know well, John Podesta. I've talked to John. John has already had a meeting, a virtual meeting with uh, his new Chinese counterpart, Ambassador Liu Zhenmin, who's a veteran climate negotiator. And I think the combination of the United States and China working together with the rest of the world on climate is going to be an important one. Another area where we're trying to cooperate is in global health. We have a remaining ongoing disagreement over uh, the origin data from the Wuhan crisis um, in early 2020 that started the pandemic. Um, and that's really in the World Health Organization now to debate the issue of origin data. But beyond that, the United States and China are both countries with enormous capacity in public health. And whether we're going to be facing epidemics in the future or pandemics, we've had four pandemics since uh, 2002, 2003, we've got to be working together. And so the two leaders, President Biden and President Xi agreed, try to find a way to work together in global public health. And we're doing that. And, and a third issue I would mention on the cooperative side is food security. One of the um, terrible consequences, and there are so many, of Russia's barbaric and illegal invasion of Ukraine and war over the last uh, more than two years now has been the disruption of, of the marketing the, and the export of grain from two of the major grain powers in the world, Russia and Ukraine, and it's had terrible consequences in parts of South Asia, particularly in the Horn of Africa. And so we've agreed with the Chinese to try to work on that problem as well. So while we have a largely competitive relationship, and I think that's going to define the relationship in many respects for the future, we do try to engage with China as well. Uh, so those are the three points uh, that I wanted to make, uh, Susie. We have a relatively more stable government-to-government -government relationship, number one. Number two, but it's highly competitive, and we are standing our ground out here in China representing the United States on issue after issue. And third, we, as the two strongest powers in the world, we owe it to each other, to our peoples, but particularly the rest of the world, to try to work together to solve big human problems like climate. Looking forward to a, a good conversation, Susie. And again, I'm, I apologize that I couldn't make the meeting in Honolulu, but it's uh, it's nonetheless very good to be with you. So much, Ambassador, for that very comprehensive view from every issue you touched upon it, um, the full range of the complexity of this relationship, this um, strategic competition, along with this the stable parts of our relationship or the desire to be stable. So thank you so much. We have a whole host of excellent questions that were submitted by our community. And thank you 
to everyone who submitted questions from all around the world. So if you're okay with an ambassador, I'd like to dive right into, because it will sure. touch upon some of the things you introduce these ideas. And that first question that I want to um, share by one of the um, listeners is, what do Chinese elites really believe about the two themes in PRC propaganda that the, the, um, the asker says? Number one, the alleged decline of the United States of America. And two, the purported inevitable continued rise of China. Wondered what your perspectives on that, those Thank statements you that you hear. Thank you, Susie. Uh, you know, President Biden actually answered this question at the very end of his State of the Union uh, speech last week when, and I'm not, uh, I can't repeat exactly what was said. I don't have it in front of me, but essentially he said, you know, a lot of people have been predicting that China would overtake the United States, but uh, obviously we beg to differ. We have a strong country. The United States economy is had the most impressive performance of any major economy over the last few years. And that continues with our low unemployment rate, our relatively low inflation rate with the extraordinary growth, but particularly with the strengths that we have, we're the world leader, our tech companies in artificial intelligence, which is going to be a generationally transformative uh, technology. We have rebounded very well as an economy from the scourge of COVID, the pandemic. Um, and um, we have, I think our universities are the envy of the world, uh, especially our tertiary educational system. I could go on and on, but the United States is strong. And I would say out here in the Indo-Pacific, what President Biden has succeeded in doing is strengthening the American alliance system. I've got to tell you, um, the U.S.-Japan alliance is as strong now as it's ever been, going all the way back to the late 1940s and early 1950s. The remarkable turnaround in the relationship between Japan and the Republic of Korea and the trilateral pro process that the president put together with, with the leaders of the Republic of Korea and Japan at Camp David back, la back last autumn. The fact that the Philippines under President Marcos, has firmly returned to a full embrace in our military alliance with that pivotal country, uh, the Philippines, where we're standing by them in some of their uh, territorial disputes uh, with uh, the People's Republic of China, the development of AUKUS, the continued strong, strong partnership with Australia. And I mentioned before in my opening remarks, you know, India is obviously a non-aligned country, and has been for uh, since its uh, since its birth, but India has joined Japan, Australia, and the United States in the Quad at the head of government level, and that it uh, that has been, I think, a game changer in this part of the region. So, uh, we don't agree with those in the Chinese leadership who say that the East is rising and the West is declining. That's not how we see um, our power position in the Indo-Pacific. And it's another interesting development, by the way, has been the fact that particularly since the start of the Ukraine war, Europe, the European Union, the NATO countries have turned very much to think now of their strategic position in East Asia and the U.S. alliance with Europe through NATO. And I'm a former and proud to say a former ambassador to NATO is as strong now as it's ever been. So um, there's just no way that anybody can make the charge that somehow the United States is declining. We are strengthening both strategically, militarily, uh, as well as economically. And so um, that's how I'd answer that very good question. Thank you, Ambassador. And if I could just quickly follow up on that, do you think what you've, you've stated is the United States is strong in so many different elements that you've mentioned? And some Chinese elites perhaps believe that. Are there some that don't believe that um, PRC propaganda? Yeah, you know, I live here and I read the China Daily. My Mandarin is not good enough to read it in Mandarin, so I read it in English. But I read it every day. And I'm sure that there are people in the government here in the Communist Party who believe somehow that, you know, that China is going to eclipse the United States. I don't see it happening. If you look at, you know, hard metrics. So, for instance... For a decade now, lots of people in China and some in other parts of the world have been predicting that China would overtake the United States in nominal GDP, you know, the size of in, in nominal economic terms, the size of an economy. Well, it's not happening. In fact, the gap is widening 
in favor of the United States. And there are now many economists who think that day may never come. If you look at um, the projections for Chinese economic growth, China, of course, has had an extraordinary run over the last 40 years, the fastest uh, rise to economic power in recorded, recorded history. And yet that growth rate is slowing down. Most economists that I read out here, uh, American and Chinese, are predicting that uh, in a year or two or three, China will probably be down to two or three percent GDP, nominal GDP growth. That that's going to persist. There are structural issues out here: the lack of consumption uh, in the economy, the property bubble and property crisis, which is a big part of the economy here. If you add to that the demographic crisis, uh, the lowest rates of birth that they've had in um, in uh, many many decades uh, over the last couple of years. Um, China is entering a different phase of its economic history. Well, the United States is booming. And if you look at the transformative technologies, and I named some of them before, biotechnology, which is such an important part of the economy where I come from, in Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and many other parts of the United States, we're the world leader uh, in artificial intelligence. The United States is the world leader in machine learning and quantum sciences. And you know, we have this virtual triangle uh, in the United States really since the Second World War and after where the government funds basic science research. Our universities are very important in incubating ideas. And of course, our private sector brings those technologies to the market. It's a virtuous triangle. It's worked for us for a long time. Of course, we've had our ups and downs over many decades, but this is a particularly, if you're an American, and you want our country to succeed both at home and overseas, this is a particularly optimistic time when it comes to our economic performance, and especially with advanced technology. Thanks, Ambassador, for sharing that optimism. I'm going to go to the next question that we got from our audience. Is it possible to imagine in the future that the Chinese Communist Party could lose its grip on power or perhaps expand its rule of law in the next few decades? Well, you know, that's a that's an interesting question, but I think I'm going to take the fifth on this. Uh, you know, I'm a diplomat and um, uh, I think I'm I don't comment on internal politics here. Uh, and I don't think it would be wise for me to do that. Uh, I also learned a lesson when I was State Department spokesperson in the Clinton administration a long time ago. Never answer a hypothetical question. I think I'll decline that to answer this question. Fair enough, Ambassador. So I'll just jump to the next one. <laughs> We've got a lot anyway. We've got a lot of questions. Thanks, everyone. What new challenges, um, does, and you kind of talked about it, what new challenges does China's slowing economy pose to the United States and the rest of the world? Well, you know, we're obviously tracking Chinese policy here, economic policy very closely. And um, what we're hearing, especially coming out of the double session of the National People's Congress over the last two weeks, the Liang Wei, uh, we're hearing that the, the Chinese intend to um, uh, ramp up, increase rather dramatically the manufacturing power of China in order to try to deal with the downturn in the economy and produce more growth and produce more jobs. If that happens and there is excess manufacturing capa capacity, so more solar panels, more electric vehicles, that kind of thing, and if China exports them, to the rest of the world at artificially low prices or even in, at dumping prices, then that's going to roil the global trade system. And we have already called attention to this publicly. Our Treasury Department has done so. Uh, I I did so in a major speech here uh, two weeks ago at the American Chamber of Commerce here in Beijing. Um, that would be very unwise. And there will be a reaction by countries around the world. Let me give you an example. The European Union has uh, launched an investigation into the import uh, uh, about the importation of electric Chinese electric vehicles into the EU market. And uh, you hear voices in our own Congress and you hear warnings from our administration, clear warnings that China can't export its excess capacity in a way that would be unfair by un trying to undercut um, our competitors, our businesses with artificially low Chinese prices. One of the, and we've seen this story before, one of the um, advantages that some of these Chinese companies have, let's just say electric vehicles, they have all sorts of subsidies from provincial governments, as well as from the central government in Beijing that allows them to sell their products um, 
at artificially low prices, and that's unfair in the marketplace. So I think that's a major issue uh, for 2024. Thank you, Ambassador, for that um, overview. Um, and here is this question, and you can answer it any way you want to. It doesn't have to focus on the domestic, but what do you believe are the biggest constraints on Xi Jinping's exercise of power? And you can uh, answer that in any way that you, you'd like. Well, you know, again, I'm, uh, I certainly don't want to give any advice to the government of China. And um, I would just say this. There's no question that over the last 10, now 11 years, uh, since uh, President Xi Jinping has been in power, we've seen um, an increase in the power of the Communist Party. Um, maybe a diminution in the power of the state council and the government of China. But he's a very powerful actor in this uh, system, as you know. Uh, and uh, he has, of course, several roles. He's president of, um, of the People's Republic of China. He's general secretary of the party, the Communist Party. He's also chairman of the Central Military Commission. So he plays an extraordinary uh, strong role in this in this country. Uh, it's not the job of the American ambassador or any of us who are in my mission here to be commenting on internal politics. We stay away from that. And by the way, we also stay away from commenting on the election in the United States. We are all American government officials here. We're subject to the Hatch Act in the United States, which prohibits us from, from really um, taking a public stand in the election. So we don't do that, do that in our mission. I don't do that. We are um, non-political uh, and non-partisan, if you will, in this mission. And I think um, that's another question where um, I'm going to take a pass in giving you more detail. But thank you for asking it. Well, well thank you, Ambassador, for educating us, because that's what this is all about, you know, and uh, sharing uh, insights and understanding the complex nature of the role that you have to play, which kind of leads me to this next question that was asked. You, you sort of talked about it, given that you're have, you're engaging, um, you are uh, giving speeches, you're sharing. You were, you know, recently on sixty minutes, you know, very um, carefully navigating a very complex situation. But the question is, what avenues, maybe other avenues of public diplomacy that are still available to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, the United States, and and are there roles like? For institutions like the East West Center to help in that in that um, people to people connections. Well, first of all, I think it's you know, China is our relationship with China is so complicated and so challenging and so consequential for us that there's an essential central role for the East West Center and organizations like this in having providing a forum so Americans can discuss and debate. And ask tough questions, as you're asking me, and you have a right to do that, about this relationship. So uh, as I look ahead, obviously right now, you know, we're focused on the war in Ukraine, Russia's brutal war. Uh, we're focused in the tragic situation in Haiti. Um, but now and over the long term, particularly the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's no question that China is going to be the, the, the major preoccupation uh, of all those issues in American foreign policy. And so we want to have a citizenry that is well-versed in China and understands that what's at stake for the United States in this relationship, where we have to compete and be very tough-minded, where we have to be critical of the Chinese and where we have to summon a strengthening of American power. That's important. And that can take place through discussion and debate. And that's why I thank you for providing this forum. So that's certainly true. It's more challenging to do that here in China because, you know, we're subject to the firewall. Uh, Google cannot operate here. Facebook cannot operate here. Instagram cannot operate here. TikTok cannot operate here. I find it supremely ironic that government officials here in China, Chinese officials have been criticizing the United States for the debate we're currently having in, on TikTok when they won't even let TikTok be available to 1.4 billion Chinese. So um, we try in our mission, we're on the Chinese social media platforms of Weibo and WeChat. We have 1.2 million followers on our Twitter account. And of course, in the Chinese diaspora, people can have access to that. We have a very talented public diplomacy staff, Mandarin speakers, people who know this country. And 
you know, we're competing in the marketplace to put American ideas and American principles and American ideals forward in the battle of ideas that we have between our belief that democracy and freedom uh, should be the essential building blocks of any society. And of course, the alternative belief uh, of the Communist Party here. So um, China has an extraordinarily strong uh, public diplomacy network. There's CGTN, which a lot of Americans have access to, the Chinese government's television station. Uh, they are very active on social media. They're trying to influence American public opinion. So it's part of our job to tell the truth about America out here to correct the misperceptions, to correct the distortions uh, of American society and American policy that I read about every single day in the Chinese dominated, the government dominated press here, the unfree press here. So we're happy to take on this debate. It's part of what we do here. And I think it's what the American people would expect an American embassy to be doing in, in Beijing, in our consulates in Shenyang and North China, Wuhan in Central China, Shanghai, East China, and Guangzhou in South China. We're a big mission here, and um, we're try trying to do our best to protect American interests. Thank you, Ambassador, for being on the what I call the front lines of diplomacy there. Um, and we try to do our part here at the East-West Center, so thank you for that. Thank you. And, you know, going to your, you talked about allies and partners. So this next question deals with one of our um, the United States ally is, what do you think Beijing's strategic goal is in its continuously increasing pressure on the Philippines? And the second part of their question is, how far do you think they will go in testing U.S. willingness to act to defend the Philippines? Well, we are very concerned by the coercive pressure that uh, that China is trying to put on the Philippines. Um, and you've seen over the last couple of months uh, some tense standoffs between uh, Filipino naval forces, naval vessels, and uh, both Chinese Coast Guard and um, and Chinese military vessels uh, at a place called Second Thomas Shoal, and also in Scarborough Shoal. Now it's important for everybody on this um, podcast, to, excuse me, this um, this Zoomcast, to understand that the International Court of Justice, which is the relevant legal body, ruled in July 2016 decisively in favor of the Philippines, and so that that territory is the sovereign territory of the Philippines, and that China's legal basis, legal claim to it, has no basis in international law. The, all the rest of the world understands that and recognizes that this is sovereign Filipino territory, but China refuses to agree and ignores the International Court of Justice ruling. So uh, we want to see, obviously, peace prevail, and we want to see China cease and desist from its provocative actions. And you've seen a very strong American support for the Philippines based on our mutual defense treaty of 1951. And we hope very much that um, this will be a quieter next few months, but we've been very decisive and very clear about our support for the Philippines. Thank you, Ambassador, for, for that answer. The next question is, do we encourage Chinese foreign investment in the United States and in non-strategic industries? How much interest, if any, do you see from US, U.S. localities and states trying to encourage Chinese investment? Susie, as I said before, um, after Mexico and China are, and Canada, excuse me, our two leading trade partners, our free uh, trade partners in North America, China's our third leading trade partner. So last year, uh, big trade relationship, $575 billion, although it was about $110 billion lower than the year before. There are reasons for that we can get into, but an important trade relationship in terms of Chinese investment in the United States. If Chinese companies seek to invest in sensitive areas to our national security, then that has to go under a government, a U.S. government review, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment of the United States run by the Treasury Department, and has been very active over many administrations in screening uh, Chinese investments in sensitive areas that are important to us for our national security. Uh, if Chinese companies are investing in areas that have no relationship or no impact whatsoever on our national security, then that does happen. Chinese companies invest in American companies. They Chinese companies in some sectors, non-sensitive, set up plants and factories in the United States and run businesses there. Um, you know, we've had a 
nearly symbiotic economic relationship over the last 40 years. But we have made, uh, oh, the, the Biden administration has made it very clear we're no longer going to support either the export of American technology into China in a way that would help the Chinese intelligence or military. And conversely, we're going to look very closely at investments that would have a negative impact on our national security. So like everything else in the U.S.-China relationship, it's complicated. And it's interesting for all these questions that uh, you're posing, and they're all good ones. Um, you know, we could actually probably have a three-day seminar at the East-West Center over most of them to dig very deeply into them. And there's often, you know, you've got to point out sometimes the, the permutations of these questions that are, are quite complicated for us. So we take this very seriously. We are not going to give China um, a leg up in the military technology competition that we're currently in and will be in for a long time. Our great Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, somebody I have a lot of respect for, came out here to visit us in late August, early September. And she said publicly, and I really admired her for this, she said, when it comes to national security on technology, uh, she said, we're not going to compromise and we're not going to negotiate because our national security comes first. And, you know, the job, the fundamental purpose of our government is to protect the American people. And so that's what we're trying to do in this very complicated question of technology. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador. So the next question is, how does the U.S. currently balance treating Hong Kong as part of China for some purposes and distinct from China for other legal and economic purposes? Well, it is complicated. I was in Hong Kong um, the earlier part of this week. And as you know, when Hong Kong uh, reverted to, um, uh, to, the, to so the sovereign control of the People's Republic of China on June 30th, 1997. It began a new era in everyone's relationship with Hong Kong. Uh, and we have maintained a consulate there since the handover in 1997. That consulate's been there for 181 years. And it's a unique consulate. It is an independent consulate. It doesn't report through an embassy uh, to uh, the Secretary of State in Washington. Uh, so I have no authority uh, over that consulate. It's led by a good friend of mine and a great career diplomat, Greg May. He and I spent uh, two days together this week kind of comparing notes, meeting with the American business community. We went out to the University of Chicago, which is our flagship American university in Hong Kong, met a lot of Chinese students and American students. We also met journalists. So we just, I was trying to get, after not having been there for five years, um, a better sense of what's happening at an important time in the evolution of Hong Kong itself. So it is a complicated arrangement, but it's, you know, what we think by maintaining our independent consulate there, we're well served. And we have a great group of people out there representing us. Thank you, Ambassador. So I'm going to um, ask one more question and then maybe go to some closing comments. Um, I appreciate um, all the time and the comprehensive answers you've given. This other question is about other um, countries who are in what some people call the global south um, that maybe not are not as close allies or partners with the United States. What place do they have? And this is a broader question more than just China. What place do they have in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy? Well, you know, um, we uh, believe that countries shouldn't be forced to choose. This is not, you know, a repeat of the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s when one side would demand that some other neutral country take their side. Uh, we understand that countries have a right to trade. They have a right to have close political relations with other countries. And I think our Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, as he's traveled around the world, I think he's, I know he's said it in both the Asia Pacific, the Indo Pacific, excuse me, in Africa, Latin America, that countries have a right to choose and we're not forcing them to choose. But we think our, our model and our friendship is, is a very attractive proposition for these countries. Uh, we're living in a time when middle powers are rising. Uh, countries like Indonesia, for instance, uh, here in the Indo-Pacific or Turkey, um, in uh, the, the country that links both Europe and Asia, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Brazil, of course, is a major power in the world right now. And out here in the Indo-Pacific, there's Singapore, uh, which is uh, a city-state, very close friend, 
of the United States in every respect. So um, a good part of our diplomacy here, and certainly here, even in our mission in China, is to be talking to um, all the countries that have representation, diplomatic representation here in China, how can we work together? How can we get closer? How can we trade more often? How can we, how can they participate with us um, in our military exercises or participate with us diplomatically? And obviously the Chinese are very, the, the government of People's Republic of China, very aggressive through the Belt Road Initiative in trying to extend their influence. And so there's a competition of sorts. But it's a, in my case, in my view, a healthy competition. And again, this is kind of where we started this conversation. The United States is on the upswing as a global power, economically, strategically. And I think the great difference that we have, uh, maybe the competitive advantage we have over China is we have allies and partners around the world. And we've built them up since the close of the Second World War. Think of NATO. Think of our the East Asian alliances that I talked about at the beginning of the interview and our partnerships with countries that maybe are not formal treaty allies, but want to work with us. And, and I think any objective assessment of the last three years about global politics would come to the conclusion that the United States is strengthening as a global power. And we're proud of that. Uh, and we certainly want to be a good friend to countries around the world in the so-called global south. South, we got to invent a better term for all of us to use. Uh, and um, and I think you know you'll see it, you've seen an increased focus by us. Uh, Secretary of State uh, was in the Caribbean and Latin America in recent weeks. He's uh, Secretary Blinken has traveled. Secretary Austin has traveled. My friend, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, our ambassador of the UN, very frequently traveling to Africa and Latin America. So we're all hands on deck. We're a global power, and uh, we're going to put our best foot forward. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, you know that's going to be the last question because I know you're on a tight timeline. But I wanted to ask you if you had. You, that was a wonderful closing, but if you had any other final thoughts before we close out this wonderful session with you um, and uh, and thanking you again. Well, Susie, thank you. And I guess maybe the final thought here is, you know, if, if it's true, and I know it is, that we're going to have a highly challenging, often difficult competitive relationship between China and the United States, um, as that proceeds... We've got to make sure that our people are connected. It's to the strategic advantage of the United States that the next generation, this gets very much to the work of the East-West Center, the next generation of Americans uh, understands China, that people um, who are interested in this part of the world speak Mandarin, that uh, for, the American, uh, for the American Foreign Service, for the American military in the 2030s and 40s, there are young people now committing to learn more about China that will lead us forward in both the public sector and the government sector and the private sector. So to me, that's important. And since COVID just pulled us apart as two societies, we're spending a lot of time trying to reconnect the universities, the students, boost tourist travel, keep the business ties so that we can compete with China, certainly, but also understand this country. And the same goes the other way around. Our doors should be open to Chinese students in the United States. So uh, I believe in that deeply. Our Secretary of State and our President believe it as well. And I think that's something I'd leave you with as, as a good challenge uh, for the East-West Center and for all of us involved in this relationship. Senator, so thank you so much um, for highlighting how important the people-to-people -people relationships are. And we're happy to do our part at the East-West Center. And we have since 1960. Um, we have a lot of alumni who are there uh, in China as well. And we continue to have students learn about uh, China as well as the United States. So thank you again, Ambassador Burns, for sharing your time and amazing expertise today. And thank you or mahalo to our audience for joining us and for submitting such excellent questions. And we hope that you found the presentation to be insightful. And please join us for future programming. We have an excellent and great lineup of events this month on the China Seminar. To see what's coming up next, visit eastwestcenter.org backslash events. Take care. Thank you again, Ambassador, and aloha to everyone. <laughs>